No tears in heaven. We'll sing all three verses. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given. Worthy are thou, 
prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to worship you and sing praises to you. Thank you for another beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you for blessing all of us with a new building so that our church will have a chance to grow. Thank you for the Lord, for the people who attend here and to give their time and continue to be shining examples of your word. And help us to continue to be there in your service. Bless those that have lost loved ones recently. Comfort the Purdue family. As bless them through their troubling time as they lost Patty this week. Bless those under doctor's care and those that are sick. Heal them, Lord, and bring them back to our, their normal health. Be with us, our, be with our shut-ins and those that look after them. Help them, the caretakers, to have light burdens and they comfort them. Be with our military. Be with our first responders. God guard and protect them. Lord, please remember to help us all to be examples of your word and help our church to grow. Bless us all and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would, please turn to selection number 100. Number 100, the Lord's Supper. We'll sing the first and last verse of this song before we're taking the Lord's table this morning. And then before collection of our offering, we'll sing the first and last verse of 98, Sweet Out of Prayer. When we meet in sweet chapter 11, we're going to read verses 23 through 27. And it reads, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on this night, when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the cup or this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the, of the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We, we're grateful for you sending your son to die on the cross and the, the body that was broken for us. We pray now that we, that we take this emblem that represents the body, the bread, and we do so in a way that, that you would have us to do. Please forgive us of all of our sins, dear God, and be with us as we take this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Father, we come here this morning thanking you for the ultimate sacrifice that you made for us, sending your only son to down across for us. We have a chance to spend eternal life with you in heaven. This time we ask you to bless this cup that we're about to take, and we ask that we pray that we take it in a manner well pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul gives orders for how it's to be done. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there is no gatherings when I come. What's all about? Dear Lord, we're grateful for everything that you've given us and that you continue to give us. We, we understand that every breath is a, is a gift from you. Father, we're grateful for every opportunity that's led us to this point so far, all the people that have gone into the hard work. But most importantly, God, we're, we're grateful for you and your sacrifice that you gave us with uh, Jesus' death on the cross. We understand that that you use us as tools on this earth to, to, to make the church grow and that every talent we have and every every gift we've been given is, is to be used for that the spreading of the kingdom. We hope, dear God, that, that everything we do now is in a way that's been um, accordance to your will and that we give with a, a cheerful heart and that, that you give us more that we can give back. Father, please be with us as we do this. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, please turn to the 
mark him number 531. 531, Living by Faith. This will serve as our hymn of invitation and encouragement this morning. <clears throat> After you've done that, please turn to hymn number 86. Sing to me of heaven. We'll sing the first and last verse of this song before the message. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace from the stand over the podium, we sure will. I want to echo what Brent said. The singing is indeed very beautiful in here. Uh, Ricky Catlin and I were at the door there as people were coming in, and to, to hear the echo of the singing from back there is remarkable. And it, and I, I can gather that even being here beside Dana on the front row, that it definitely is different. But one of the things I just want to point out about being in this new location this morning that I don't know if we've really thought about when we've taken... Maybe take it for granted. There's sunlight. Now, not just from the door in which shadows are cast on a particular wall, but there is sunlight. And I'm thankful for the beautiful fall day that we have, but I'll be thankful for a cloudy, snowy, rainy day and knowing that we have the light of God, the sunlight that God has provided here for us. Uh, on the heels of the singing and talking about that, a reminder of our song and prayer service tonight, and I hope that you will all be a part of it. I certainly under, understand that uh, work schedules and such, but if there is an opportunity to come and to have a service of this, tonight's the night. For us to give thanks to God for all that we have been blessed with. Not just here, but also in the place that we came from, because we were blessed back then as well. For those men who were here and those families who were here from day one, you know how thankful that uh, this congregation is for the, uh, the work and the assistance of getting to that point. And of course, we're thankful for even today. And so with that in mind, let us gather together tonight for singing and for praying and to give that devotion and praise. And whether it is for Thanksgiving or for making our petitions known for those who are suffering at this time, we urge you to be here tonight together. 
So we are in a new place. And for those who are watching on Facebook Live who are streaming with us today, we are in our new location in Prince George County. And we are thankful for the newness that is this place. It gives new, uh, new opportunity for us. And whenever we talk about newness, we, we certainly do think about some of the benefits of those things. And whether you have a new car or new clothes or home or whatever the case may be, you appreciate the feeling of having that newness. I remember just two years ago, whenever we were in Williamsburg for uh, the day, I think this is for our anniversary, that I bought a brand new pair of shoes. I needed a new pair of shoes. I have a tendency to uh, wear out a pair of shoes. I don't, uh, I'll wait until there's a hole in them before I start going to a new pair. And when you put in those new shoes, I know, <laughs> when you put on those new shoes, you feel comfortable, you feel relaxed. It just feels great to have those on, whether it's even a new shirt, pair of pants, whatever the case is, you appreciate that newness. But what is newness really? You know, certainly we think about something that's shiny and it is coming out of the package or out of the wrapper or whatever. But what is that newness? And if you look at a definition of it, you see that it's something that did not exist before. It was not known or existing years before. And we sometimes think about technology and how new it is. Could you imagine 30 years ago streaming a service on a cell phone? And yet we've been doing that now for the better part of 10 years. And I say 10 because... I think that's roughly the time where a lot of these phones began to develop that ability to do that. I know that when we were in South Hill, that we would pull out the phone and start streaming, I believe, back in 2016 or so. But you think about just all the technology, the things that we can do now that we couldn't do before and how great it is. But also there's something that takes us, uh, that it's also something that takes the place of the one before. And we talk about our location, that this is the place that we were before. And now that this is taking that place... And again, we talk about shoes and clothing and cars. And you buy, buy a brand new car and it takes that place and it, that newness that, uh, that has there, that new car smell and just having that experience. But then there's also the idea that something new gives you new life, a renewed en energy and enthusiasm, that breath of fresh air. Some of you, whenever you change jobs, if you've ever gone from one place to the next, you get to that, that excitement of thinking, I don't have to do that anymore. I get to try this. I don't get to, uh, that you have those types of experiences. And, and even today, the singing that we had here was invigorated because it's a new experience for us. And we hope that, this, that that's just not the only thing that we look at with regards to being here and certainly being a part of the church. Because we'll talk about in a few minutes about identity and how newness should not be just the material things. Because I want to talk about what biblical newness is. The Bible speaks of that. And our definition for new that we looked at with those three examples does fit into what God's word says regarding newness. It encompasses both the physical and the spiritual in regards to our life. If you turn over to Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Paul there writing in his letter to the Romans, he says that we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, we too might walk in a newness of life. Now, newness of life in there is that there is a refreshing and renewed spirit when you obey the gospel. And each and every one of us who have been baptized into Christ will say that on that day in which we came out, out of the waters of baptism, that we had an excitement and a recharging, a newness, a renewed energy for life. But most importantly, to be able to serve our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. It's a fresh start because our sins are forgiven. We have the burdens are lifted. We sing the song, burdens are lifted at Calvary. And we are excited to know that those sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ. In Romans chapter 7 verse 6. Again Paul says that we now. Or now we are released from the law. Having died to that which held us captive. So that we serve in the new way of the spirit. And not in the old way of the written code. In our lessons over this past uh, few Wednesday nights. We've referred to our. Actually and also in Acts. With, uh, on Sunday mornings. We talked about the use of the term way. And that the Bible speaks of our path in our life of Christ, the Christian covenant, as being a new way. And we think about whenever you're driving around new ways, new roads. And I, I don't, I'll admit that uh, up until a few months ago, I probably didn't drive around Prince George County as much as I you know, should. But you think about these roundabouts that have been coming away, coming around. 
And many of you probably have different opinions about how you feel about a roundabout. And certainly if you pay attention, I think you can get around the bout. And you can get through there. It's supposed to make things easier. But you think about how roads are always changing in order to give us a better way. The interstate system, what, 60, 70 years ago, was developed so that we would have a better way to make things quicker across the country, especially for military and government needs, but also for you. Could you imagine taking US 301 down to Florida, or US 1 down to Florida, or even up to Baltimore all the time? Now, granted, those times are a little bit different because it's getting congested because of the interstates. But the idea is a new way is what helps us out. You, you embrace those new processes, and that's what the Bible tells us, that through Jesus Christ, we have a new way. Now, outwardly and fleshly, our relationship with God has physical implications. We certainly believe and we know about our outward confession that we make, our baptism, which is seen outwardly but is in the response of uh, the obedience of an appeal to God for a good conscience. In First Corinthians, excuse me, First Peter chapter three, verse twenty-one, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you now it's not as a removal of dirt. From the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, our lives are changed, and it's a new life before God through Jesus Christ. But then there's that inward renewal or inward uh, side of the change, and that is that it is spiritually done. Our relationship has those internal and spiritual implications. Back to that phrase, good conscience, and we've read that a couple of times in our Bible studies where Paul talks about that he is of good conscience toward them. And that means that it's a matter of our hearts being changed, a matter of our hearts being renewed. We also think about the idea of what you eat or consume, and not just a physical idea, but even from the spiritual implication of knowing that whatever you consume with your eyes and what you hear is a part of what goes into your mind, what goes into your heart, and that does cause a change. And certainly whenever we look at having a newness of life, we want to adjust to where we don't see the things of the world, we don't hear the things of the world, and we don't process those things as we used to. God gives some other examples in the Word in regards to newness, and you know, He provides those examples for us to be able to understand why newness is important. And I, I can't help but think about the Israelites going into the land of Canaan. Then we know back from our study in, uh, in Genesis chapter 12 that God had per promised Abraham this, this land and certainly the other promises that go along with it. But there is a new land here and it was meant for God's people. And it was supposed to be a place for them to be able to dwell, a land flowing of milk and honey, and a place in which there was supposed to be a renewed relationship with God in that they were supposed to rid the land of the inhabitants. They were supposed to get rid of the inhabitants of those possessions and not have anything to do with them. But we know from their history that they did not do that, and therefore they allowed the old things, the bad things, to come in. And those things created issues with the relationship with God. They hampered their growth. But if you also look in Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, there's an example there of an example of new and old as Jesus talks about lines. To turn there with me in Mark chapter 2, starting with verse 18, the question about fasting had come up in regards to why the, the uh, disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting, but yet the disciples of Christ were not. In verse 18 of uh, Mark 2, it says that now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? And as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. And the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it. The new from the old and the worst tear is made. And no one points or rather puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. So why do I bring that up? Well, certainly the context of the passage is Jesus talking about the question of fasting, but also he's referring to matters of the old law with the message that he's proclaimed, he was proclaiming. 
But the example can show that man will apply old with new things. That we'll take something old and try to fit it into a new pattern or try to reconcile the two things together. Now, certainly we're talking about the old covenant here with regards to this passage. And, uh, you know, there's some elements there that, that would have to be addressed with the disciples. And you think about even in the New Testament writings and the letters that the Israelites, uh, excuse me, the uh, Jewish Christians were trying to bring circumcision and making it a binding matter in terms of the Christian faith. And there were other things as well. But the reason I bring this up is not necessarily to talk about the old law, but to say that we as humans, but more specifically as Christians, have a tendency to misuse or handle improperly the godly newness that has been granted to us. That we've been blessed with by God's grace. And when we do that is that we take the liberty that God has given to us and we misuse it for our own fleshly purposes. That we'll bind on things that we have no business binding on in regards to the Christian faith. But we also will try to squeeze in or wedge in sinful activities, old things that we have put away, and try to put them into the new, night, the new life, the new body, the new wineskins, if you will. And frankly, that just doesn't work. The godly newness that we have does not belong in that old body or in those old skins, in a manner of speaking. And what I want to talk about this morning is that our responsibility as Christians is to embrace the godly newness that he has asked us to strive for. Four points we'll take away with this. And the first one is, is that whenever we're embracing godly newness, we need to do so with eagerness. You know, we've talked about the fact that there was a lot of excitement over the last couple of weeks about coming here. And when you talk about that excitement, it's, it's infectious. But when you talk about it, that eagerness and that excitement, you're, it means having zeal. It means having that enthusiasm. And, and I think that we can look at a word also that is used for specifically in Scripture, and that is the word rejoicing, to further emphasize the eagerness or excitement that we have or that we should have. But when it comes to our faith in Christ, and when it comes to one putting on Christ in baptism, when it comes to living out that life of, of the Christian faith, we need to maintain that enthusiasm. Now, I will go back to that for just a moment because I do hope that even though we are, we are enthusiastic, we are eager right now because of the new dwelling and being in this new location, being in Prince George County, I hope that you will maintain that eagerness for the service that is to come, for the work that needs to be done in this community. But more importantly, I hope that each and every one of us are in just embracing the spiritual newness that we have been blessed with through God's grace. You think about in Acts chapter 8, just after Stephen has been stoned, and the fact that there was a great persecution that happened with regards to the church at that time. And we see in verse eight, uh, excuse me, verse one of Acts chapter eight, that Paul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entered the house, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And then verse four is where I want you to be focused on, and that is that now those who were scattered went preaching the word. It doesn't tell us that they were in dismay and that they were depressed and that they began to lament the fact that why did I obey the gospel? They were empowered. They were encouraged. They were eager to continue on preaching it. And they were rejoicing in the Lord for the greatness that is the gospel of Christ. In Acts chapter 8 also, verse 39, as you look at the account of the Ethiopian eunuch, Receiving the message, receiving the word, and being baptized into Christ in verse, verse 38. We'll read actually verses 35 and following. He says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began with the scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going around the, along the road, they came to the water, and the eunuch said, Here is baptized. Here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, in verse 37, That if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And in verse 38, he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And in verse 39 is the verse I want you to see. 
And that when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And that echoes what we were talking about a moment ago, that when we come up out of the waters of baptism, we are excited. We are enthusiastic. But we need to maintain that enthusiasm throughout our life. And that is a tough thing to do. I admit, we go through trials. We'll go through roller coasters, if you will, in regards to our Christian faith. And I say even here, in this location, we will do that. But we need to maintain that enthusiasm and that hope. In Romans chapter 12, verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing an instant in prayer. One other verse I would look at in the book of Acts is verse 41 of Acts chapter 5. Here we have the apostles rejoicing even after suffering for Christ's sake. In, Rome, in, excuse me, in uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 41, and there in that passage, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. In 2 Corinthians 1 verse 12, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation or our, our conversation in the world and more abundantly to your there will be times where it's going to be tough. There will be difficult times. But we must strive to have that eagerness for godly newness. But number two, we need to embrace godly newness by getting rid of old things. I was thinking about this, this uh, over the last couple of weeks because um, about a year ago, many of you know that uh, Dana and I suffered a, uh, a little house accident with a little flooding. We had a... Uh, Wash a little water line behind the washing machine to just completely burst and uh, cause a lot of uh, uh, water to <laughs> go everywhere. A lot, a little water, yeah. But we say that because we've noticed over the course of the last year, as we have, it's the improvements have been made, and certainly as things had to be moved around, that we've collected a lot of stuff. And I have to go backwards a few years because I know when we moved from our apartment on the river back in. 2001, we'd collected a lot of stuff in just that little time. Even to the point that I think Juanita had said, how can two people who only live in a two-bedroom apartment collect so much stuff? And it happened even when we moved into the house on Prince George Avenue, and even as we moved to 4th Avenue and then to the house we live in in Chester, we have to ask ourselves, why in the world? Because when you move, typically you go from house to house and you start doing a little purging of things. I don't need this. I don't need that. And I think that we didn't make the time to do that kind of thing. I'm sorry, honey. But the point is, is that when you go into something new, you want to get rid of it. When you go and buy a new car, and I'm, I will tell you, I am guilty of this, that my trunk in my last car was filled with stuff from my days at Terminex. It was filled with all kinds of things. And whenever that truck that I have was finally purchased, I had to purge it because I didn't want that into that new truck. I needed only a couple of things to be taken over. But the reason I bring this up is that when we do those types of things, we want to get rid of the clutter. And whenever you put on the newness that is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have no reason to bring over that old stuff. Whenever you obey the gospel of Christ, you are coming to the cross of Jesus and saying, I don't need this trouble anymore. I don't need the sin. I don't need the struggle. I'm putting it before you. God, forgive me through your son's blood. Wash me of my sins. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. From the Old Testament, Isaiah 43, verses 18 through 19. Again, a passage we can apply to this because... It is written, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers and the desert. God's way is the way. That newness of life is what we need in order to be able to go forth. So the things that we have put away, let's put those old things away and let's go forward in the newness of Christ, in the newness of this opportunity. Number three. Let us embrace godly newness by striving for spiritual cleanliness. When you buy said car, said house, 
will tell you that it is a chore. And I hate to use the word chore because even in the house it is a chore. But keeping a new place or any place clean is a constant effort. And some of you are saying, yes, and when you have kids, it makes it even more fun. But trying to keep clean, in, you know, in, with a house and, you know, things clutter, you have dust that just appears out of nowhere. You're thinking, I do everything I can, take the shoes off in a mud room. I'd make sure that I just change the entire outfit before I go into the house. And yet, dust appears. Things just happen. But the fact is, we do have to worry, work on cleanliness in a house. But... I want to say, first of all, that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. That there's nothing of my doing that I can do that's going to remove that sin. It's only the blood of Christ that does so. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 and 9, I want to read that passage, and then I'll set up the rest of this point for you. But 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And in that passage, as, as John opens up his, his letter, he says, But if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, as Peter starts, he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Christ Jesus and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. You see, Peter is talking about that sprinkle of his blood, which cleanses us of our sins, but he also refers to or references obedience because there is that necessary component. And that's what I think John is also talking about is that while we are washed in the blood of Christ, we still have a responsibility to walk in that pathway that Christ provided for us. And that is that we're supposed to be diligent and diligent in God's word. If you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 through 26, there's a passage that we often go to when it comes to attendance and, and certainly coming together as Christians. And I think that part of this conversation this morning is that our work to remain cleansed and to remain in Christ is based upon not only of our own actions, but also being together as brothers and sisters in Christ. That we as a church need to make sure that we are always striving to be with one another, to encourage and build ourselves up. But in Hebrews chapter 10, starting with verse 22, he says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. And in verse 26, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer or remains a sacrifice for sins. What is the writer saying? Whether it's Paul or Paulus or whoever is the author, what is he saying there? Well, number one, to draw near to God with full faith and assurance. And that is that we, we draw near to God by our prayer and our faith and then certainly uh, you know, continuing to be in the scriptures. But we do draw near to God, meaning we make our purpose to walk toward God. But also we hold fast that confession of faith without wavering. That we have a confidence in knowing that we are saved by the blood of Christ. That we consider how to stir up one another in love and good works. And that there shows that this is not just a, a, a situation in which if we're all on our own, once you come out of the waters of baptism, we're in this together. That we encourage one another. That we not neglect being together. And it's not just about the worship service. I've made mention before that our conversation on group me is great. That's wonderful. We need to continue that. But we also need to just try to find time to be together. And the older I get, the more I want to be with y'all. No offense to my, my coworkers at Estes. I love them dearly. But he also says, don't keep on sinning deliberately. And that's the acknowledgement to say that, yes, we will slip up. We will make mistakes. And those things are understandable. We'll confess those amongst one another. We will confess those before God for forgiveness. 
But when you sin deliberately, that you then, as I talked about before, misuse the liberty of God in a way that not only hurts you, but hurts your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you hurt your relationship with God through Jesus Christ, there remains no sacrifice. Shall I continue to sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. But number four. Embrace godly newness by exercising great care. We've heard the definition of apathy, I don't know and I don't care. That's basically what the definition is, that you have no emotion or you lack feeling or you lack interest or concern for something. And if I can go back to the illustration for a moment about buying a house or a car, could you imagine just buying one of those and you just don't care? How long will that vehicle last? How long will that house last? How long before those pests, the six-legged, the four-legged kind, make their way inside? You have to take good care of something. And it's not just about the material things. It's also about the things within that house or within said place or vehicle. You, you have a house, but you also have a home. But you take good care of your home. That families make sure that they take care of those that are inside the house. We take care of the relationships that we forge, and we certainly know that the relationships we have here are strong, and they certainly will continue to grow stronger. But we hope, as we look out the windows around us, as we look around at the large map of the county, as we published last week in the bulletin, that we hope that we are gonna be developing relationships in this county and the surrounding area, and we will take good care to do that in Christ Jesus. Embracing God's newness requires genuine concern. And that means also as a Christian that whenever you put on Christ, that you don't just come out of the waters and say, hey, I'll see you later. It means that you take care of the spiritual side of life this body is no longer yours. It never was yours, to be quite honest. But when you put on Christ in baptism, you are saying this body is no longer mine in any capacity. It is his. You think about apathy for just a moment with regards to the Laodiceans, Revelation 3, 16. That church there, as John is writing and recording the words of Christ, is is being taken to task because, as we read in verse 15 of Revelation 3, I know your works, you are neither hot nor cold. Would that you would, were at we either cold or hot, so that because of your lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And I've heard people say that that verse could mean that they aren't, are they hot meaning you're on for Jesus, or are you cold meaning you have nothing to do with Jesus? I've heard people say that you're hot because when you take a warm bath and you take that warm water and that knowing how it cleanses you makes you feel good. And then even on a hot day, cold water feels good and it has a refreshing component to it. Whether you take either side of how that is supposed to be applied in regards to the Lord's church and your relationship with Christ, the idea of being lukewarm is an abomination to God, which means if you are apathetic in your faith, God is willing to spit you out. And the warning that was made to the Laodiceans was not to become complacent, not to be apathetic. If you'll turn over with me to Zephaniah for just a moment. Zephaniah, a prophet that we probably don't turn to very often in regards to readings. But there's a passage here in which he talks about complacency. Zephaniah 1, verses 12 through 13, he says, At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good and will not do ill. Their goods shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. And though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. And they, though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. You think about that from the idea of being good stewards of God's word. Good stewards of the things that we've been blessed with. Stewards of the, ta stewards of the talents that we, that we receive. We want to make sure that we continue to be ready to go for God. That we do take great care of said things. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 32. Proverbs 1, 32, my apologies. And in that passage there as we look, 
Solomon there, as he is with his writing says. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. Allowing our faith to become an afterthought is dangerous. And our spiritual service, whenever displaced in what we would call a safe place, and when I say a safe place, meaning that you feel comfortable, you develop a sense of complacency, and there is danger that is in that. Our final comments for this this morning is this, is that number one, let us with our new home and our new location, our new focus, we got to seek new opportunities. This is just stage one, or maybe stage two, maybe stage three. But the idea is that this is not a stopping point at all. This is the beginning of the next phase of this congregation to work. And we need to make sure that we are very well aware of that. Number two, we will seek those new relationships, a new field to sow, the seed of the gospel. And let us be eager to go forth and do that. With our obedience to the gospel, we have said that we will give up the old to be resurrected to a new being, a new life. We go back to Romans 6 for just a moment, verse 4. We are buried, therefore, with him by baptism and death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, to put off your old self, which belongs to you, that belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on a new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Remember that we are walking in the newness of life. Remember that you have a new life, a new body in Christ. Let's make sure that our lives show that not only to this community, but to all. And then lastly, as we talk about newness, we can't help but look at Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7, for that is the newness that we certainly strive for. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7, those beautiful words penned by John, regards to the new heaven and the new earth. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as God, as their God. In verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from the eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making new, all things new. And also he said, Write this down, for these words are, are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am at the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. And the one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. Let us pray. Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning that we are here in your, new, in your creation. And that we're here to see a new day that we're able to continue to breathe the breath of life that you've given to humanity. And we're thankful, Father, to be a part of this Lord's Day morning. And we are thankful for so much that you have blessed us with. And as we have talked about from your holy word, the matters of newness, we pray that we will utilize the newness that you provide through us through your son's blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. The forgiveness of sins and to take the message of the gospel to all the, uh, of this county and the, the surrounding areas, but to anyone that we come in contact with. And as best as we contain that word, we pray, Father, that, that we show indeed the love and mercy and desire for all men to be saved and to lead a life of sanctification and purity. 
that Jesus demonstrated in his life and as was demonstrated by the apostles. We ask, Father, that you will be with us as we now go forward from this day forward, that we will, of course, seek opportunity with the new, op the new area, the new resources, and just in general, anything that we have received that is from you. We pray, Father, that we will utilize that to the glory of your kingdom and to you. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen. If there's someone here today who has forgotten that, about that newness, if you're a Christian and you have forgotten exactly what God has blessed us with through that newness, we would urge you to come and to make that matter known before your brothers and sisters in Christ. We'll pray over you and certainly we'll help you. But if there's someone here today who has not put on that new body in Christ, that new way of life through baptism for the remission of your sins, we would urge you to allow us to, to, to talk with you, to teach you, to sit down with you. Just We urge that you'll believe this message of the gospel, that you are looking to repent of this world, to put away the old and to embrace the new. Confess Jesus as Lord and Savior and be baptized for the remission of your sins, walking in obedience to the newness of life until that great day, as together we stand and as we sing. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth over everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above.
so much for allowing us to be here in this building this morning, to hear a message of your word, to sing songs of your praise. We thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus Christ, and thank you for allowing him to live on the earth, to spread his message, to die a cruel death on the cross so that we may have a chance at eternal life with you in heaven. Thank you, Father, for this congregation, thank you for the leadership, thank you for the opportunities that you have blessed us with. We ask that we continue to look to you for guidance and wisdom and that we always do things that are in accordance with your will. We pray, Father, at this time for Danny and Wendy and Joe and the rest of the party family as they experience their loss. We, we ask you to comfort them and be with them and give them the strength. We pray, Father, for the rest of our number that is sick or shut in or traveling. We ask that you be with those that were not able to be here this morning. We ask that you will help heal them and bring them back to us at a point at a at a later date or earliest convenience. We pray, Father, for our nation. We pray that you will guide and direct those in charge and they will make decisions based upon your will. We pray, Father, for our world. We pray for peace in the Middle East. We pray for Peace with our military, our first responders. We pray for their safety. We pray, Father, as we move forward throughout this day, that you will guide, guard, and protect us and forgive us of all of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 